Great. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. And it's my pleasure today that we have Michael Berry with us. Uh, Michael is a consulting professor at Stanford D School, or yep. the Design School. And uh, today's format is maybe a little different from what some of you who attend these sessions may be used to. Michael and I are going to have a conversation about design thinking and specifically <clears throat> not only a, some background on design thinking, but also how that plays in the world of more of a, a process-centered kind of an environment. But to start with, Michael, share a little bit about your background. It's quite interesting in how you've gotten to the D School <clears throat> and also some of the things that you do beyond that. Yeah, the, um, the, the D School is an interesting venture. Um, I have taught at Stanford a course called Need Finding for a lot of years. And um, the D School was a venture at Stanford that said, let's, let's figure out how we not just teach, teach engineers and designers, but start teaching other branches of engineering. Uh, other areas of the school about this thing called design with the belief that we can help whatever you're doing, whether it's biochemistry or computer science, with the skills that designers have. So that was kind of the, the starting point for the D. Great. So in terms of um, your background, you, mm -hmm. you teach at the D school. And yep. for those yep. who haven't had a chance to see that, it's a, a non-traditional, yep. interesting uh, place. Um, the philosophy behind that in terms of this interdisciplinary approach and bringing together, it's rather unique even at Stanford, but also uh, in general. Yeah, the, the, the core philosophy in the, the D is that people learn best by doing and that they've created an environment that you basically um, build and develop uh, design thinking skills through project work. Um, and project work... Um, things that are important, not just to you, but to essentially a larger community. Things that are going to make a difference. Um, there's an enormous push about this idea of extreme collaboration. Everything is done um, in teams uh, with the belief that at the end of the day, you are going to go out and work with teams. So how do you really be creative in groups? So that's really essential. Um, in terms of my own practice, uh, I also do a course in the D called Cross-Cultural Design. Uh, where we take um, and partner with Peking University and do an exchange between uh, Stanford engineering students, uh, Peking University engineering students, and have them solve a problem that has to work in both cultures. Um, in terms of background, uh, I work with lots of marketers, designers, engineers, business people, um, have gotten the chance to do design research in lots of different countries. Um, and for lots of different kinds of work, uh, whether it's product, service, new category development, and um, as I said, for lots of different companies. Um, uh, and companies that are both high-tech, consumable, uh, nonprofits, uh, and entities around the world. So it's kind of this background that we want to share with our students, the belief that um, these are tools that can be applied in a lot of different contexts where innovation and creativity is essential. That's what you want to get out of it at the end. But it's going to be applied in sort of non-traditional, potentially uh, we're going to have computer science people, biochem uh, uh, educators. They need, pre they need that sense of seeing the world differently just as much as a designer who has to come up with a new, new, new iPhone. I think that's, it brings up an interesting point. You know, when we talk about what is design thinking, I think there's a sense out there, particularly in, a, in, the, uh, in this more process environment, the world of project program management, yeah, that yeah. the sense that design thinking is a product, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's product designers, it's the ideas of the world, it's the apples. Mm -hmm. And um, I know, uh, just kind of a side note, we were chatting and you once had an interesting question. What came first, innovation or design yeah. thinking? Someone will ask. I'm just kind of curious. Maybe you could provide a little perspective on that. Yeah. It, certainly there is a lot of buzz about design thinking, and it feels like, gee, maybe is it a fad or a trend? Um, I would say it's a really good question. Innovation is essentially the, the thing we're interested in, and we have always had innovation. Right? And I think what design thinking is looking at is how do we um, increase the chance that we're going to get interesting, compelling innovation more often. Um, and, and just to clarify, um, it's easy to mistake invention for innovation. Mm. Um, and invention is coming up with something new. And, and the patent offices are full of wonderful new things that nobody wants. 
part of innovation and part of the foundation of innovation is that that new thing fits into our world, makes that world in some way better, creates new value, satisfies needs, which is sort of the foundation of my course. And design thinking is a way of uh, more consistently bringing together the kind of deep knowledge of people and culture that you need to have in order to get that invention, that's something new, to actually stick, to actually work. And uh, you know, I, I think we came from a place where uh, uh, we see you know, graveyards products that have failed, where we have put phenomenal technology, energy, uh, uh, human resource and capital, and it hasn't connected. We look at pad-based computing, and that was something that we spent 20, 30 years pursuing. And we just got it right. We just got it right. And I think the foundation here is how can we more consistently get it right? And that's where design thinking came from. Um, it's, it, it's interesting. I think, again, in terms of uh, some people who may say, well, how does this fit in a world particularly uh, we've got a, a lot of individuals who participate in the Advanced Project Management Program who come from a world of IC and mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. so we're going to talk about that yeah. a bit more yeah. later. But if you think about we're all chartered with thinking more innovatively, looking sure. at more creative ways yeah. to implement. And, and quite frankly, it's that transition to adoption, which often is what undermines the successful completion of initiatives or projects, and yeah. you're speaking to that, uh, yeah. I think there, there's a parallel. Let's explore design thinking a, a little bit more in sure. terms of understanding it. We'd like to, to take a little bit, and, and I think, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about design thinking not being just for uh, designers and, and maybe why it's a, a bit relevant beyond just product design. Um, but maybe uh, before we jump into an overview to, to a, a way of thinking about that and some of the framework and tools, um, share a little bit more about why you see the, kind of the relevancy and potentially, um, uh, let me ask this a little differently, if you think about where you've seen this applied, what, what's kind of the most seemingly out there kind of way that design thinking was applied that someone wouldn't have thought this is how to, this isn't a place where design thinking can benefit. No. Yeah. I've been kind of a, a curveball question. No. <laughs> I would say, um, and, and I'm, I'm going to use an example um, that I, I don't know if it's unusual, but it, I'm going to, I started talking about iPhones and, and iPads. and. Um, for a lot of years, we kind of looked at um, the kind of single functionality of pad. Is it a computer? Uh, is it simply a smaller version? And then we, we threw telephony on top of it. And what was fascinating, um, and Steve Jobs gets a lot of credit at being a visionary, and certainly was, but um, he was very opposed to the idea that the iPhone and the apps be an open source system. He really wanted it to be owned. And um, a lot of people in the company felt very differently. Um, and Steve at that time had some liver replacement, so he wasn't on scene. And suddenly the apps became something that a uh, set of tools that could be shared were created and offered to a larger community. And if I had to say, what is the success of that platform? It is the ability, not of Apple, to be unbelievably creative. And, and yes, Apple has been. But it's the ability to offer the tools to now just not 100 designers, 1,000 designers. We now have a set of tools that a million designers are looking at their lives, understanding them, and going, I now have a medium that I can fix what, what's going on with me, and I can offer it back out. The iPhone and Apple's success, in large measure, came from something that Steve was actually very opposed to, that, that ability to share right, the creativity with non-designers. And yet, that is a phenomenal, and you talk to any manufacturing company at this point in Asia, in US, Japan, um, and it's not the hardware. It's not the hardware. It's the apps, and it's because the apps create experiences and their experiences that you cannot get elsewhere, and that's where the real value is. So in this sense, suddenly that 
shift of taking um, what was simply an app that presumably could have been owned and controlled by Apple, and if you look at all the other predecessors, they'd try to really bound that. And suddenly it became an open source, creative way of solving everybody's problems. And that, to me, is an interesting example where uh, suddenly needs and leveraging everyone's creative design thinking became an unbelievable success. And at the end of the day, Apple still owns it. Apple still, um, that, that kind of valence of success, of creativity, of coolness, still comes back to them. So it's an interesting sense of, um, as I said, we, we like to think about design thinking as a combination of um, creativity and analytic thinking, going back and forth between those, but always grounded in a deep knowledge. And the fascinating thing about apps is it is everyone's own first-person experience that gets it started. And it's at a scale that I can do something about it. So I think that's a great transition as we, as we look at mm -hmm. Um, design thinking and dive a little deeper in terms of defining it. Share with us a little bit. We've got um, five different uh, statements that may look like statements uh, that folks yeah. are right now, but they're not statements. They're much more than that. Yeah. Um, so it's also easy we talk about uh, there is a design process or a design thinking process, and if we teach the process, engage the process, out will pop amazing things. And of course, as anybody who's taken an engineering course, right, you, you know, learning the, the process of, you know, determining stress and strength doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to do it well. So I think what we've seen is within design thinking, the process is actually less important, meaning the stepping through a, a, a tightly described set of activities than a set of really important tools that are going to be used by a group a little more intuitively, a little more in response to the situation they find themselves in. And those, those tools, as you said, are something more. They're kind of a foundation of um, thinking about problems differently and essentially getting around a lot of the stumbling blocks that more traditional analytic thinking, some systems thinking, can get groups into where they often aren't, a they box themselves in. And, and by the way, we, we believe design thinking is on top of those other modes of thinking. Critical thinking, systems thinking, all very, very important. But it's how do we do better? It's a yes and phenomena, right? Yes to those things and this as well. So first one, and it's this idea of observing with empathy, um, that sense of not just being an expert, knowing the answers, but um, seeing what is very difficult to see and is always around you. Um, these are the rules and norms that guide people's lives, often guide your lives. And the point is you can't change things until you can see them clearly. So a lot of what we teach is how do you see that world you're in? See the things that go without being stated that you take for granted are almost invisible to you. And it's often the most difficult to see things that are the most important to innovation, creating value, um, and we find clues. We find clues, and those clues lead to insights, and that gets to the next next thing, which is this idea of asking why. Um, in a university, that's actually a really hard question to ask. Um, we got here because we knew the answers. So to ask those dumb questions those questions of what seems obvious but may be really, really critical, that's actually a skill we have to teach. Um, and this sense of insights come from not just a flash, although on occasion those flashes happen and it's delightful when they do, but there's also uh, b building all of the models that help you see the complexity of the world you've just explored, hopefully reveal white space. So lots and lots of different approaches to modeling the world and being able to ask why. Why do things that don't exactly make sense make sense? Um, one thing, and, and I think there's a very strong push towards uh, data and data analytics. Uh, the difficulty there is you're often dealing only with correlation. This deals with causality. Why is something happening? 
and that you often have to get into people's lives. You have to get your hands dirty. You got to explore. Um, and this gets into. Oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was just, no. just going to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These, these first two, you know, it's very interesting yeah. in terms of uh, even if if we're developing a new system, uh, you know, we, we seem to know what the requirements are. There's a often a standard kind of approach to doing that. There's gates we pass through. Yeah. We develop something, and then we get to the other end. And again, when it's time to hand it off and, and see people start using it and, and get full adoption, that's often where the resistance and barrier becomes. And it seems, it seems to me that our ability to really think a little differently, looking for those insights, gathering that data in potentially a different way yeah. can help us kind of um, unearth what some of those issues are that aren't necessarily the technical requirements. It's yeah. more about how people are really going to use it. How's it going to save something, save time or improve efficiency or work better, but also even a common interface might, might end up. Your, your comment about kind of receiving a set of product specs and getting to work um, is a challenge because most of our engineers are very good at doing that. Most of our classes structure kind of work that way. Uh, the difference here is we also want our students to go, is that the right problem to be solving? What are the goals? And I got the product, the problem you gave me, but maybe it isn't the most important problem to be solving to get at what you want to what is, in fact, the goal of the project. So that's in this asking why. We're not just asking why of the outside world from research. We're also turning it inward. And that sense of coming up with a very different set of criteria. And perhaps one of those criteria is, is this the best question to get at what you want? So that's a, a new set of skills that we, we believe we're giving to our students. Um, another one, and this is, um, uh, there's a very strong practice to get to the answer. We tend to create convergers people who want to get to an answer quickly, efficiently, effectively, and move on. Uh, what you find is to get good ideas, you need to have a lot of ideas. And that ability to diverge, to be able to creatively solve a problem from many different points of view, and some of those points of view are different perspectives, um, to be able to really uh, have a group use their skills, their ability to come at the problem. As I said, and if you've got a biologist and somebody who is an educator and an engineer and a business person together, they're going to solve that problem in a different way. And if they are only converging, coming to a single answer, you're not going to get the benefit of that group mind. That said, you do have to know how to converge. <laughs> right? And that sense of, of, of determining what is not just the best answer, because right? we often uh, do processes where who's going to win. And the big point of the design thinking is to essentially build the best answer. Out of these many answers, how do you find elements of both that will create the best solution to where you want to go? And that's as much about team dynamics as it is about putting out lots of post-its and voting. Um, some of the other things, and this gets to another piece that's central to design thinking, central to our program. And I mentioned getting your hands dirty. Uh, it's both getting, getting out in people's environments, but it's then putting solutions, very low res solutions, very early out into people's hands to begin to evaluate your thinking. Um, we have a tendency to not want to uh, uh, iterate and create lots of solutions. We want to get perfect solution. And what we found is really important is it takes a lot of courage to get your initial ideas out, try them out, and iterate. Iterate a lot. Um, and that sense of being able to creatively find ways to ask key questions of your service or product or process that you want to develop and test those very, very early on. Um, the disaster we've seen over and over were immense amount of money are poured in, and the fundamentals haven't actually been understood. So this is about getting those fundamentals understood, tested, and having a team involved in those. And your resolution starts to change as you start to build more knowledge through iterative cycles. Um, the last piece, and um, 
this idea of storytelling, making ideas compelling, and it seems like, well, isn't that something that's more of an, an advertiser's job, or isn't that what you do with the final PowerPoint when you want to pitch your idea to the venture guys? And what we found is um, narrative and storytelling is essential both in data collection, meaning I need to understand stories. People will understand and communicate very complex ideas through stories. Stories are a way of making sense of the data. The other piece, though, is being able to craft a story of your idea, of your service, of what you're doing, and change behavior. Because if you've gone through all of this, have a fantastic idea, and it doesn't affect the organization you're in, or the community around you, you've wasted your time and everybody else's. So this notion of how does narrative and storytelling tie all this together is critical. And this kind of creates an interesting, an interesting, um, interesting both set of tools. It looks like a messy process, but I would argue it isn't. And it appears messy because it isn't always the same. But that, I think, is essential to a kind of the creative nature of, of what we're after. And it's, it's really, it, it's an iterative process in, in terms of there is a process here, but I think of, you know, user uh, use, use cases, yeah. which is yep. a more standard way, yep. but push on that and think about, for instance, storytelling, that that's an, an element of that that can be applied up front, yes. as well as when you're looking to gain acceptance throughout the process and that's then right. when you're looking for implementation. So I, I think the opportunity for people to think about you know, as you've mentioned, look at the tools, recognize how they build, but also how they can be used in different, kind of at different times in different ways. Beautiful. And not be so locked into, I can't do, I can't generate ideas. Certainly we want to, uh, you know, diverge and then converge. Absolutely, but absolutely. there's tools here that can be used and employed at different times. That's different exactly ways. right. That is exactly right. And uh, I think the goal in, as you said, the D school, and what we're doing through this sort of project-based learning is you need to practice using these. And you need to practice not in artificial situations, but where you got skin in the game, where it matters. So we, it's a little off of what, what we had planned to talk about today, but mm. maybe share with people just, um, <clears throat> I, I've had the opportunity to not only uh, work and see at the D school, but also we have the, the class and yep. the program for yep. project uh, innovation through design thinking. Talk a little more about that importance of, of rolling up your sleeves and 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 actually kind of doing and committing the time. But I, I think of maybe paint a little picture of what happens even when we're in that class, um, because I think it's quite a different way of thinking. And and you know, I'm, I'm smiling because I'm thinking about you know people come. I, ha I had a friend that said, oh, you're just uh, you know teaching kindergartners, and, and there's something to that though. Isn't um. there? So, yeah, that's, it's a funny one because you are not wrong. Uh, a lot of the elements of it have, have, have look a little like kindergarten. On the surface. On the surface. <laughs> on the surface. And I, uh, but I think um, what we have found by um, putting people in situations where they need to solve a problem that they have no idea how to get through. Most of the problems we face these days start that way, at least the interesting ones do. And that ability to discover in yourself what does an insight feel like where you actually see something you thought you knew differently has a very powerful shift in by stepping out, by using these tools in different ways, by loosening up. I suddenly um, am smarter than I thought I was. A lot of people, and when I say that, it's the notion that this, I wouldn't have been able to do this before I tried some of this stuff out before I was willing to let a team interact with me in these kinds of ways, before I was willing to go, I'm really anxious, I need to get to that answer as fast as I can. And taking the deep breath, getting a large range of answers, using some tools and starting to see patterns I never thought I could get to before. And what we've seen over and over is the quality of your work changes, and we've done this in a lot of companies who've evaluated work on design thinking and work off design thinking and what is not just did, did it get done on time but is the quality of what was put out 
better? Is it satisfying needs? Is it making us money uh, more effectively? And we've seen over and over that um, the stuff that designers used to use to, to create stuff can be used by lots of people. And um, it's everything, and, and we love it. Um, this We started out uh, uh, some of the tools, and I'm thinking about, uh, we, we do a tool called mind mapping, where you basically have something you want to think about, um, and I need to make all the connections about this thing, and whether it's shopping or, or a, you know, a, a, a carbon, carbon atom, you basically go through and empty your mind and, and lay it out. And it's a nice way of making connections, and you go all the way out to you just start literally asking questions. And we had chemies right, who would take the tool, go back home to their fume hoods, right, and they'd be working on a problem, and somebody would start mind mapping. And their buddy would, what, what are you doing? What are you, what are you doing right on the fume? And I said, no, I think, I, I, I think I'm, I've, got, I've got it. I've got it. This, this links to this. Right. And I was like, where did you learn to do that? Like, oh, yeah, that's, 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 that's one of those design thinking things. Like, where do I get some of that? Yeah. So what we've seen is um, you can take your kind of current set of skills, current set of thinking, and you can do the yes and build on them with some of the tools and just do a little better. I think what's fascinating, though, is that larger practice. And as I said, if you're an engineer, it takes years to get good at it. But as you start to get good at a collection of these tools, as you start to uh, inform and, and then really energize groups, you start getting to much more interesting things more regularly. And when I say interesting things, um, it's small scale usability stuff, right? I, I need to have a new way of helping seniors, you know, uh, 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 let others know when they fall all the way to very large-scale complex problems. So we see this getting getting used throughout that, that, that continuum. Yeah. So really, a, a couple of things that really strike me, the, the yes and building upon ways of doing things currently, but also there is this, this uh, you know, need to invest the time, the energy, but also to try things on to create this environment, which is what happens yep. I've seen with different, you know, groups and teams that you've worked with. Yep. So they can try these tools and figure out, you know, some of them may be applicable, some may not, where they occur and the like. And uh, just to transition a little bit, um, you know, to, to explore just maybe some, some insights. I think you, you recently wrote an article that, that was quite interesting and, and it, uh, it based on some research you did. And, and, you know, when we think about how we apply design thinking in more of a process-heavy environment. Sure. Um, there's kind of a way of thinking uh, or kind of a key insight, and there's many, but one in particular I thought maybe we could dive into a little bit, this issue about framing and reframing. And then you had yeah. kind of three major findings that I think would be interesting for folks to hear yeah, about. Yeah, so, so for me, the real power of design thinking, and this is kind of laddering up from the tools, as you said, is my ability to reframe a problem I've got. And when I said our students will challenge, is that the right problem to be solving? That's kind of the core of a, of a reframing. It's that sense of you don't just accept what you got. I can see it from different ways. And, and there's some advantages to, to doing that. So for example, um, and I think kind of the next slide, um, sometimes you basically need more solutions. I just don't have enough solutions. Uh, and if I had more solutions, my sense is I'd probably have a have a, a, a better end result. And a classic example of this is uh, if someone says, you know, I need a bridge. I need a bridge. They're, they're from Stanford Engineering, right? Give, give me a give me a bridge. And if you accept that, right, you you could build a suspension bridge, you know, a cantilever bridge, but your solutions are going to be all within a bridge space. Lots of bridges. Different kinds, but all bridges. And here's, if you ask why, why, why do you need a bridge? The answer may be, oh, I, I need to get across the river. And now suddenly the solution space changes. It changes from bridges to maybe a boat would work. Maybe if I start looking at the river <laughs> and your skills, maybe you can swim across. Point being, there's a very different solution space. And if I ask why again, why do you need to get across a river, 
The answer is, well, I, I, I need to tell somebody on the other side something really important. Now the solution space changes again. So my point, these are all ways of getting to a reframe. The HY question opens it up and effectively reframes the problem that you, um, because you were simply given the problem and didn't question it, you may be answering the wrong question, right? So that's one. So what I just gave you is I need more answers to a problem. Easy way to get it. That asking why over and over, framing it differently, different answers come. So that's kind of the, the, the starting point and sort of the simplest way we think of the advantages of design thinking. Just get yeah. more ideas. Well, and I, uh, I think that just a, a, a one more thought on that is that, again, in a process-driven environment, so often as you uh, alluded to earlier, we're given, here's what we, here's the problem, yep. go yep. solve it, here's a, a system that we currently have or one that we need to create to, yep. to meet this need. Yep. And uh, recognizing that, that, you know, culturally and environmentally, the organization you work in, there can be some pushback, but sure. really the value of asking why and to yes. look, re, re, looking at, at, at different ways of framing can often lead to the fact that we don't create a, you know, we don't build it and nobody comes at the end because yep. that wasn't really the system that we needed or that really didn't address the issue. That was exactly the right. And actually what you just said kind of leads to the next issue. Uh, and the ex next one is you actually cannot solve the problem as it is framed. You just can't get there from here. Um, and classic, and, and, and one that came out of my work, um, we were um, working with Shure Microphone. And uh, Shure sells microphones to the largest seller of microphones in the world. Uh, and they sell them to a lot of rock musicians. And they noted that um, the customers, their rock musicians were losing their hearing. And that's kind of a catastrophe and losing it in really unpleasant ways. Tinnitus, ringing in the ears. So they were concerned, how do we help our customers? How do we protect them? And they believed that if they provided a kind of um, earplug that could let them hear and essentially take them to an audiologist and get um, what was seen as a prophylactic solution, something that could reduce sound levels and protect their hearing, um, this would be a really important thing to do. Huge need, huge need. And when we tried it out, musicians went, <laughs> no effing way am I putting right a hearing. I, that's horrible. I won't do it. I won't do it. And sure, initially it was like, this is really discouraging. Right? They don't want it. And again, if you think of a musician as a you know 16-year-old rock gods don't wear hearing aids. Right? Okay. <laughs> What's fascinating was the reframe. And as we asked, and this was a displacement where we asked people to go through a period of time of trying out some rough prototypes, all the way to getting them to perform in front of an audience. They started to discover a lot of things about their own performance that these things gave them that they didn't know. One actually can't couldn't hear themselves on stage. Uh, suddenly, I could hear myself. Suddenly, with a wireless system, I could move around on stage, and I wasn't locked to the little speaker that was the only thing I could hear. Uh, the engineers on stage loved it because now suddenly I wasn't getting feedback between the on-stage speakers and microphones. Suddenly, the whole ecosystem started to change, and we could solve the problem of hearing protection. The final result, we never, ever talked about hearing protection, ever. That would kill the project. But the reframe around performance created a whole suite of solutions of new processes. Uh, it changed how musicians play on stage. And yes, within the last six years, rates of hearing loss among musicians have gone down. So it worked. But the reframe was critical. And if you led with that initial frame, the problem wasn't solvable. Very interesting. Yeah. Very applicable. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's one more piece that we mm. wanted to, to touch on. Uh, there was a third element here, and share a little bit about that. So uh, we are in a changing world. Um, we, it's a changing world both from um, increase of technological horsepower. Processing power is doubling every 16 months. Um, we are having environmental issues that are seen insurmountable. Um, 
social issues, customers expecting far more, not just a product or a service, but I want to be transformation. So this is a world you're working in, and suddenly um, your solutions need to operate in essentially uh, unbounded space. A lot of different elements come together. We refer to these as wicked problems. Mm -hmm. And if you are doing anything interesting today, it's going to have some aspect of that wicked problem. And we believe that design thinking is a really important way to begin to creatively find threads, find solutions that can pull all the aspects of that problem that have to work together. Right. If you take it apart, you may not be able to get it put back together again. Right. Meaning take it apart, solve everything independently, put it back together. Design thinking is very useful at um, solving problems in total, getting that first path through the problem. But suddenly, I get it. I see how the whole piece can work together. It doesn't mean you're not going to go back and use those other tools to refine it, to really get it right. But um, creatively helping people engage wicked problems, we found, is one of the more powerful, powerful things that uh, design thinking offers us. And so this, this changing uh, one element and, and yeah. looking at the way it affects others. So yeah. focusing on that, not being afraid to take on the wicked problem, but then kind of a, playing with different aspects, engaging with different aspects rather than. Yeah, it's, it's the sense of the kind of systems problems we're looking at are ecologies. Right? And whether it's dealing with culture that's an ecology or our own ecology. Um, and if you come from a world where I have an engine, I can optimize the engine by taking it apart and putting it back together, and it's going to work every time. That's great. Unfortunately, that's not the environment you live in. And the problems you are wrestling with as a business, right, as a service, as a nonprofit policy, uh, Steve Jobs' iPhone. And those apps address that very complicated ecosystem and suddenly lots of people were now able to engage that complex ecosystem in ways that a um, single company and a few designers could never, ever imagine. So um, we have some hopes that um, design thinking in conjunction with other disciplines, other deep knowledge and skill will help us get at some of these wicked problems that are both scary but they also represent, if you look at it right, really, really interesting opportunity. Great. Um, we have gotten a, a host of questions. I want to thank everybody who's uh, on the line and has forwarded those to us. We're going to take a few minutes now. I'm going to pass it back to Ryan Chin. Ryan's got uh, some information we'd like to share, and then we're going to come back and take a few of those questions. Thank you, Michael. So first of all, let me thank uh, Tim and Michael. That was really enjoyable. I also wanted to thank all our participants for being here today. I do want to remind you that we, we, we probably won't be able to get to all the questions, uh, and we would thank you so much for submitting those. Uh, thank you for participating today. One last reminder that we are recording this, and we will send out a link to, the, uh, to this recording or to this presentation and webinar, so you can watch it later. Let me tell one, one quick story where I believe that uh, the, I had deep knowledge, uh, but it was the creativity that Michael was able to bring to an experience. So I, I, he, he did a, a, a design thinking exercise, and they applied it to the performance evaluation. It was maybe the most enjoyable way I've ever looked at performance evaluations and to rethink that experience. And if you have, one day maybe you'll see the video. It was just terrific and, make, and actually made me rethink how I give and, and provide performance evaluations. Again, my name is Ryan Chin. I'm with the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Just to tell you a little bit about our center who is presenting this webinar today, uh, we consider ourselves a bridge between Stanford and industry, and that means that we, we extend Stanford education, both graduate programs and professional education, to working professionals. And we've been doing this for 45 years. On the graduate side, what we do is we actually allow people to watch Stanford graduate programs, and these can be in, in the discipline through the School of Engineering. And in fact, you can earn a degree in electrical engineering, uh, computer science and management science engineering completely at a distance. Now we also take the same research and, and teachings that our faculty do in their graduate courses and in their research, and we turn those into professional education courses. And those are short courses and are more focused material. 
our most uh, popular and most successful professional education program has been the Stanford Advanced Project Management Program. And one of the reasons I think that this program has been particularly successful is our partnership with IPS Learning. And that, that partnership has allowed us not only to take what uh, the, prof the work of our faculty, Professor Ray Levitt is the academic director of this program, but also take IPS uh, experience in, in industry and really make this a powerful combination of both experience and research. Uh, and so uh, we are now in our 15th year, over near 6,000 graduates, and so I, I think it speaks to the uh, power of this program. The program is based on you can see the set of courses here. There are three core courses, and then you'll take three elective courses. Our newest uh, elective course is Project Innovation Through Design Thinking, and we're talking about design thinking today. And this course actually is being offered in a new model through our uh, online courses. Um, and will be offered this September here on campus. And it's our only time that we offer. We offer courses on campus twice a year. Um, and this, uh, this September will be the one time that we're offering Project Innovation Through Design Thinking. So if you're interested, do I want to recommend that you sign up quickly. It, it will sell out. So at this point, I'm going to ask if I, your interest in the Stanford Advanced Project Management Program. So I'm going to open the poll up now. And if you can please remember to submit your answers, we'll give you a few moments. And so while you're voting, I'll just, I'll just tell you that the, the video that uh, Michael showed, the, the session that Michael was doing on the, um, through the uh, performance evaluations and how this one, he, he challenged, the, they were challenged, the group was challenged to, to make a skit about it. And it was just the most enlightening way of how to approach and view that idea. All right, at this point, I think I'm going to just go ahead and, uh, again, thank you so much for submitting your answers. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll at this point. Thank you so much. And I'm going to remind you that the Stanford Advanced Project Management Program is offered in three different modes. So again, uh, we teach it here at Stanford. That's in March and September. Um, we typically hold it over two weeks. And so if you want to go to the website, and the website's down, the website is apm.stanford.edu. Once again, apm.stanford.edu. You can also see the contact information there. Uh, these courses are offered online uh, throughout the year, um, we, uh, um, allowing you to take the courses asynchronously um, and at your own pace. And then through our partner, we also offer them at work. And so um, if you want to have them delivered, we have them delivered at many, many places throughout the country and, in fact, across the world. So uh, if you're interested in that, we actually, you'll actually need to contact us and, we can, uh, and talk to us about how that can be done. At this point, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Tim and Michael to answer a few questions. All right. And with that, let's see. All right. Uh, so, Michael, looking at the uh, first question is kind of an intriguing one. Actually, just gets to more of a kind of at the personal level. Yeah. So, how do you account for introverted individuals? I mean, I kind of made a a joke earlier because I get some teasing from some of some of my friends outside of work about this design thinking thing. You're just going and playing with toys, but you know, the reality is, I think many you know, particularly technical professionals, they're they maybe are a little more on the introverted side. Mm -hmm. So. Um, kind of, it does rely on everyone's involvement. Yeah, you know, what are your thoughts on that? No, and I uh, that question is very close to my own heart. Uh, all evidence to the contrary, I'm actually an introvert. Um, <laughs> and, and with the definition that um, I'm not energized by groups. I love groups, but boy, need to need to find that quiet time. And to get to this idea. Um, and certainly a lot of the public presentation of design thinking, it's very active, it seems very social, and boy, you have to be out there all the time. Uh, the reality is as you use these different tools, especially um, we've found um, understanding people and using divergent thinking, meaning I really need to understand people from many different ways. Introverts are much better at doing that than extroverts. All right, introverts are able to Go inside and begin to see a lot of the different ways something could happen. Uh, the other piece that's interesting, most introverts that model abstractly, right? so we're taking reality and we're going to model it in many different ways. Ex introverts are very, very good at doing this. So what you find is within a team that begins to explore different tools and recognize people that essentially, and these tools, you said they're more, they are thinking skills. Um, those thinking skills um, 
can both be emphasized within the group and if the group understands that that skill is different than how I approach the problem. So we spend a fair amount of time helping groups understand that as they go through this problem, they're going to be different thinking skills are going to be emphasized. And some of those skills are going to be served much better by introverts who may in fact be leading effort because they are the best at doing it. And as you get to converging where I need to have that leadership and make that final decision, right? the extroverts come back once more. But it is absolutely a balance between those things. And we have found that you, you need to have everybody, everybody involved in both types, absolutely critical of the process. Great. Excellent. Excellent insight. You know, it's somewhat related, but, but really, um, you know, there is, for, for all of the excitement about the, the promise of design thinking and the successes we're seeing with it, I think there also can be kind of this skepticism. Sure. Uh, even I made, made light of, you know, friends that tease me a little bit, but in seriousness, they respect it. But leadership sometimes thinks, you know, you alluded to it earlier, we've got a problem, get to, cut to the chase, figure it out, solve it, move on be efficient. Um, so, so it almost gets to how do we help convince, uh, it's not just leadership, but mm -hmm. often there's a perception, how do we get people who don't really understand this to, to be supportive of it? So, because it does have implications for more time, I think, particularly on the front end, although even fundamental project management says plan, plan, plan before you jump in and do sure. it on some element. Sure. But the reality is we've got that tension about move fast, you know, we've got to be agile and, and move more quickly, yet um, so anyhow, I, I think I threw a few things in there. No, uh, and I have to say our experience in kind of corporate America adopting it, um, and we've we've seen it operate in a couple different ways. Um, and, and stepping back, I gave the example of the chemies with their fume hoods, and, and mind mapping was an interesting way at Stanford where it was by small examples, small everyday examples of using parts of this that we started to build credibility and people started to engage larger and larger parts of the process. Um, in corporate America, we've seen it kind of operate a little differently where, uh, and I'll, I'll give Deloitte as an example, they did a pretty extensive program where they looked at six ongoing projects, three of them, and they actually repeated it twice. Um, three of the programs had uh, were done independent of design thinking, done in a traditional way three of the programs on design thinking. And um, they then repeated it for another, another six just to kind of validate the response. And what they found was uh, overwhelmingly the, and some of the problems were problems that had been tried before and failed. The design thinking got them through it in different ways. The quality of work was different. Um, some of the problems around audit that seemed insurmountable, because you, if you frame it in a certain way, it cannot be changed. But reframing it actually found they could shift things that they thought were, uh, these are orthodoxies that are immutable, and we can start to get around things. So they actually found the design thinking uh, to give better results. The teams seem to uh, be much more effective, uh, both in the, the problem solving component and the rollout. So um, this was, and my point of it was they essentially did their own internal experiment. It wasn't simply a workshop where I try it, there's no skin in the game. All the participants, their jobs are on the line. This wasn't, this was business as usual at Deloitte. So I, I think that's the piece we've seen. Um, if there is skin in the game where I take this stuff seriously and I can't simply go back to business as usual, I need to follow through on it, we have seen um, learning happen. And, and this is no surprise, this is how we learn anything. But for organizations, that's essentially the challenge. You're learning a new set of skills. Initially, all of them are not comfortable, or they may seem to fly in the face of existing orthodoxies. And um, whether it is top-down, uh, I feel it needs to be experience-based. You can't just do it as an abstract one-day workshop and say, now everybody go do it. Uh, it needs to be some level of immersion where um, I've got something at stake and my team needs to live with this for a period of time. Uh, that seems to be work best for our students and for the organizations we've seen really, really use it. Yeah. It looks like we've got maybe time for, for one more question. 
Oh yeah, this yeah yeah this is a fun one. I'll let you read it. Well, so the yeah. the, the question that was posed was why do you think so many people address the symptoms by trying to create a way to offset the symptoms instead of addressing the problem, yeah. the, really the source, and in fact resist. In fact, you know, often they they they're not just miss uh, looking at the wrong issue, but they actually resist yeah. taking on the source of the problem. So I'm gonna. Just reference Clayton Christensen in Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, he did a fascinating, fascinating study on U.S. companies that um, essentially have crashed, <laughs> have crashed because to exactly this point, they addressed symptoms and didn't look at the problem, didn't look at that world around them. And I, I, I think what he, and so essentially it's, a, it's an issue of framing, but it's an issue of framing that is not easy to resolve since often the success of a company, and this is Clayton Christensen's premise, uh, the success keeps you from seeing the world differently. Right? You have now framed a world based on your success, and you see everything in relation to what made you successful. If that world and its situation is starting to change, you do not see it clearly. So we get back to this seeing the water. And it is not, a, I mean, he paints out over 100 companies, only one of them was able to change over time, was able to actually innovate more than once in its existence. That is, that is real. And his point was this is a horrendous, a horrendous loss of resource, of energy, and the failure happens fast. So actually uh, reframing is, is kind of an essential way to get out of that innovator's dilemma. We actually, we've got about two more minutes. Yeah. Um, is there, I mean, we've mentioned that certainly is, is part of uh, the program. We, we have a, pro, a course we teach here, and design thinking is popping up in other areas. But if people wanted to find out more about uh, design thinking, uh, are there some uh, resources available through the D School or otherwise Absolutely. where they might be able to learn a little more about this? I think there is enormous amount uh, of material now online. Uh, I think both uh, in, ter in forms of video, in forms of using tools. Uh, I think we're getting a rich source of people who are documenting how they're doing this, where it's being used, um, kind of taking the, um, the mysticism out of it, right? This is not magic, right? This is, this is you know, people uh, relying on a creative intuition that um, may have been, they've maybe gotten a little lazy with, but it's also um, kind of showing the power of, of what happens when you um, diverge before you converge and you don't do both at the same time. And it sounds, as I said, some simple things like that can have some, some pretty strong changes. Uh, another very simple thing we've seen is um, what you use to model a problem uh, can often restrict Right. what the possible solutions turn. You start to model it using some unexpected things. Uh, this classic example for us is we had students design chairs and we gave them cardboard and they came up with very ordinary solutions. We gave them pipe cleaners and a number of the students said, well, this is a horrible material to design a chair out of. But a few started to bend and twist and go, I can come up with a completely different chair and, and use the compliance of the system and do this. And, and those are all the things we're now starting to see put out online as kind of the, they seem like, oh, that's, a, that's a cool trick, let me try it out. But it's part of a larger way of thinking about um, how to understand customers deeply, how to have a dialogue with them, how to ask why, how to diverge and converge. Great, thank you. Michael, thank you so much. I think we're about at the end of our time.